<laughs> That's all like, you know, when the preacher says, can I get an amen? And somebody in the back row says, amen. <laughs> I love that song, don't you? I mean, behold, he comes. Uh, and one day he will come. And uh, he may come right in the middle of our capital campaign that uh, uh, Billy reminded us of. And I want to thank every one of you who were able to come out either Wednesday or Thursday night this past week for the uh, uh, informational sharing meetings. And uh, if you were not able to make it, there are some booklets that have been put together and a little magnet as a reminder. And I don't think they're in the foyer yet, but they will be today. So make sure you stop by and pick one up because the booklet itself really gives you a lot of the details uh, of the program. Uh, so today we want to continue in the series of messages that Malcolm started uh, last week, as today we talk about committing your talent to God. Uh, let me ask you a question. Is there anyone here who would uh, volunteer or choose, uh, let me put it like that, who would choose to live in any other country than in the United States? Anybody here other than to go as a missionary, which would be a great thing to do. I think we're all agreed that America is a great country. And America is a great country made up of 50 states, each state contributing something or some things that help to make this such a great place to live. I, I want to just test you a little bit. I want to uh, flash up some pictures here on the screen. And when you see the picture, you tell me what state comes to mind, okay? So let's have the, have the first one here. Idaho, okay? Hawaii, okay, we wouldn't, wouldn't mind being there, would we? Uh, all right. Virginia, exactly. Okay. Georgia. Yeah, Missouri, I, I think a lot of people say St. Louis, but uh, state, Missouri, yeah, okay. Florida, all right. Uh, you did, everybody gets a passing grade. In fact, you get an A+. Plus. And, you know, we could go on and on illustrating the differences between our states. But the important thing is that with all the differences, each state brings something unique uh, in its history or its resources or its people. And it's all of those things together, the key word being together, that make America a great nation. And folks, that is, I use that as an illustration because it's a great parallel to the church to the body of Jesus Christ. Every family within this congregation has its own history. Uh, every family, every person has its own unique uh, qualities. But we come together to form the family, the family of God. Each person, each family brings unique, quali unique qualities and talents to the work. Last week, Malcolm talked about the importance of our time and committing that time to God. As I've already indicated today, we're talking about uh, how important it is that we see the value of our giving our talent uh, so that Avalon can be all it can be in God's sight. Next Sunday, Malcolm's going to bring the message again. He'll be talking about committing your treasure to God. And then on November the 5th, I'll be speaking on committing uh, trust, committing to trust God. And it will be on that day, November the 5th, that each of us will have the opportunity to make a commitment of extra giving over and above our, our regular giving for a period of 18 months so that our Build the Walls campaign will be successful. But the major point I want each of us to see today is this, and it's on your outline. That is that God wants every Christian, notice this, to use his or her talents for his kingdom. God wants every Christian to use his or her talents for his kingdom. Let's look at our text together. It's where Paul writes to the church at Rome, and he says, Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. You see, so the apostle is writing to the church at Rome, and that church, like most in that day, had a very diverse group of people. There were Jews and Greeks, free men and slaves, people from all walks of life who had responded to the gospel of Christ and become followers of Christ. Although the church was then and is now literally a collage of Christian people, Paul, in writing this, wants them and us 
to see some very important principles. There are three principles that I want to glean from this passage in Romans today. The first one is this, that everyone is gifted for serving God and his church. Everyone is gifted for serving God and his church. Paul's very clear about this. In verse 6, following our text, he said we have different gifts according to the grace given us. The key word here is different. Aren't you glad, aren't you thankful that God is so imaginative in his creation, in his creative power? Can you imagine walking, every, walking in, every, in this place every Sunday morning and this is what you would see? Wouldn't that be boring? Or you nursery workers walk into the nursery every Sunday and this is what you would see? No, this now is a lot better, isn't it? Now. Notice anybody in particular up there? President Bush. <laughs> yeah, I, I put him there uh, just to insert how much we need to pray for him and how thankful that we ought to be for him. I don't know how many of you saw the uh, interview that Bill O'Reilly did uh, with President Bush, a very lengthy interview, and I was so impressed when he talked about his faith and his dependence upon God and how when he was criticized for that, that he felt pity for people who did not have a relationship to God to rely upon. But I, I show you that picture to show you that we are all different. Not only do we look different, we all have different interests, we have different passions, we have different levels of experience, skills, and talents. But although we are very different, we all have something in common. Every single one of us has a gift or gifts, a talent or talents, that God himself has instilled and nurtured within us that is to be used for his service. Uh, the Bible gives us a good example of what I'm talking about here. If we, could, we could talk about uh, dozens of different Bible characters, but let's just look at a, at a few, for example. For example, Paul. It's obvious that, that God gifted Paul with an ability to write. He is the, the major theologian for Christianity. He's the author of at least 12 books in the New Testament. And when I say he's the author, of course, keeping in mind that his words were guided and directed and inspired by God's Holy Spirit. Uh, his willingness to fulfill the leading of God's Spirit and writing the, down the fundamental doctrines of the church is absolutely critical to our understanding of God's will for us today. So Paul was a gifted teacher and, and writer. Uh, how about Peter, for example? Now, Peter wrote two books of the New Testament, but that's not normally what first comes to mind when we think of Peter. I don't know about you, but when I think of Peter, I think of Pentecost. Uh, I, I think of Peter being that one uh, that Luke chose, the Holy Spirit chose to record what Peter preached on, on the day of Pentecost, and probably him because he was always willing to jump up and, and speak at a moment's notice. Uh, when you think of uh, uh, Peter throughout his time with Jesus, he was always one of the first ones you could count on to stand up and speak to whatever occasion it was. What he said wasn't always on target uh, during those days, but may God give us more people like Peter who are willing to, to speak up and to, and to be used. It was Peter who cried out to Jesus during the storm, asking that Christ bid him to walk on the water. It was Peter who offered the answer to Jesus' question, who do men say that I am? And what Peter said that day, we refer to today as the good confession. Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And so you've got Paul with some talents and Peter with others. Or how about John as a third example? Another man greatly used of God, but with a different personality and, and a different perspective. Uh, John's gospel, you know, we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but John's gospel is different than the other three. In fact, New Testament scholars through the years often refer to the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic gospels. And the term synoptic is derived from a combination of two Greek words, one of which means together and the other meaning seeing. And so what that's saying is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke saw things together. And if, as you read and study through the Gospels, you'll notice great similarities between those three writers. But John's not included as a synoptic Gospel due to his different style and approach to the subject matter. He focuses more upon the final week in the life and ministry of Jesus, leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. 
John tells us much about the passion of Christ that we would not otherwise know if we only had Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It was John who was entrusted with the remarkable task of writing the book of Revelation, that valuable look into the future. Yes, John was very talented, but in a different way than others. And then look at Luke. Luke was by profession what? A doctor or a physician. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. He traveled with Paul through much of Paul's missionary travels. And yet, Luke was very much in the background, helping Paul behind the scenes, I guess we could say. And, and you know, some people are gifted in ways that, that put them in the spotlight, put them up on the stage, uh, preaching, teaching, it, singing. Others use their talents more effectively, like Luke, behind the scenes. In the fourth chapter of Paul's second letter to Timothy, Paul is imprisoned, uh, potentially facing his final days. Uh, I suspect he may have been a little bit discouraged. If you look at a whole paragraph there, he writes, uh, Demas has deserted me. Uh, a little bit later, he says, Alexander has done me a great deal of harm. But then notice these words in 2 Timothy 4.11. Paul says, only Luke is with me. Only five words. But can you imagine the impact of what they say? Here's a man, a physician, whose talents and gifts placed him in service to support and encourage others. I don't think we can imagine what that must have meant to Paul when he said, Luke is with me. Uh, let's look at one other New Testament personality, not as well known as Paul, Peter, Luke, and, and John. But uh, look at the scripture in Acts chapter 9. It, start, it starts in verse 36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying, and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Dorcas is that fifth personality I want us to see. Dorcas wasn't a teacher. She wasn't a writer. Yet she was a valuable asset to God's kingdom. Why? Because she used the giftedness that was given to her. She was a servant. The scripture says she was always doing good. That's a lot included in those three words, always doing good. She was not a respecter of persons. It says she helped the poor. She had a particular talent. She was a seamstress. No doubt having made clothing for many, many people. You know, I'm thankful that there are no superstars in Christianity. Sometimes the media implies that there are, but that's not the case. Anyone who thinks that he's a superstar in the kingdom of Christ is only deceiving himself. But if I were to name the superstars in my book, they'd be the widows and widowers who devote themselves to God's work. They'd be the Dorcases of this world who work using whatever talent God has given to them. The superstars in my book would be the diaper changers in the nursery. They'd be at the top of the list. Superstars, most of all, would be people who, when seeing something that needs to be done, they jump right in and do it without saying somebody ought to. They just do it. Among the spiritual gifts listed in Romans 12 are the gifts of serving, encouragement, mercy. I think Dorcas had all three of those. She had so demonstrated those talents that they, they desperately wanted her back. You know, uh, a few weeks ago uh, in one of my messages, I, uh, I made the point, I said, if Avalon, this church building, were all of a sudden to just disappear, you remember I, I talked about that, I said, you know, would anybody miss us? Well, let me ask a similar question. If you were all of a sudden to just vanish, disappear, would anybody notice? Would anything go undone uh, that you had been doing? Uh, would the church have suffered a great loss if all of a sudden you were gone? It's a good question to consider. So here are five people with different backgrounds, different talents, but together they work diligently and effectively in furthering the cause of Christ in the first century. Today, our challenge is to do the same. And that brings me to point two. And the secondly, that everyone has a responsibility to use his talent. Everyone has a responsibility to use his talent. Back in our text, 
Paul says in 12.5, we who are many form one body. In several places in the New Testament, the church is likened, as you know, to the, to the human body, the physical body. Here in Romans 12, he uses that parallel. In the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, again, he uses it in a couple of other places. It's a great parallel. We can all relate to what it's like when a part of the human body is not doing its part. Uh, personally, for the last two weeks, my left ear has been stopped up with an ear infection. Every time I have to say, huh, <laughs> what'd you say? I think I sure will be glad when that left ear gets back on the job. Uh, you know, and gets back to doing what it's supposed to be doing. Ask Mike Waldron, and I, he would be immensely happy when his shoulder gets back to doing what it's supposed to be doing. Every part of the body has, has a role. Any part of the body not carrying out its God-given responsibility has a direct and sometimes painful impact on the rest of the body. God wants us to see that truth as it relates to the church, the body of Christ. That same principle is taught by Jesus in Matthew 25 in what we usually call the, the parable of the talents. Now you, you may remember it in that parable, the talent is referring to an amount of money. Uh, three men are giving varying amounts of money. And you remember that two put what they had been given to work and, and their faithfulness produced more when their master returned. The third man, you remember, simply did what? Dug a hole and put his talent there. When the master returned, he was happy with the, very, with the first two and rewarded them. But the Bible says he was furious with the third man who did not use what he had been given. In fact, Jesus has some pretty strong words for that third individual. He said, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, although that parable referred specifically or primarily to money, I think it's very safe to say that the principle Christ is communicating to us here is that we all are responsible to use whatever it is that God has entrusted to us. An ability to sow, like Dorcas, a gift of encouragement, the ability to serve behind the scenes. Whatever your ability, whatever your talent is, God wants you to use it to advance his kingdom. In any local congregation, Avalon or any local church, Every part, every person is vital for the success of that congregation, for that congregation to be all that God wants it to be and accomplish all that God wants it to accomplish. And that brings me to the final point of today's message, and that is that we all rely on one another. We all rely upon each other. Look at the text again. Paul, clear, Paul clearly says, each member belongs to all the others. Each member belongs to all the others. There are no lone rangers uh, in the Lord's church. You know, let me illustrate it this way. I'll never forget the first symphony I attended. Uh, I went kicking and screaming. <laughs> I didn't want to go. But it was a part of a class requirement in Bible college, of some type of music appreciation class. I think, Shelby, you were on that same trip when a bunch of us went up to Richmond uh, to attend a symphony. Uh, from the very beginning, I was intrigued by the man who played the triangle. The orchestra did, I had to admit, the orchestra played beautiful music while I watched the man with the triangle. It seemed to me that a man in a black tuxedo should not be holding nothing but a small triangle and a staff with which to hit it, and he didn't hit it very often. I, my, my eyes just stayed on that man as he was sitting in the back. And 5, 10, 15 minutes would go by and he would just sit there. And then I'd see him stand up and I'd say, okay, his chance is coming. And bing, and he'd sit down, you know. And, and I thought, I was, I was so amused uh, by that. Uh, at, he would sit down, but my eyes focused on that spot. To be honest, I was thinking, I could do that. The truth is that I couldn't uh, then or now. Oh, sure, I could hit the triangle. But we wouldn't have a clue as to when to hit it or, or how to, to strike it to make it do just exactly right. You see, an orchestra provides beautiful music, and it is the coordinated mixture of woodwinds, brass instruments, stringed instruments, and percussion all coming together to form that beautiful music. Each of those groups performs differently, brings depth to the music. Every instrument relies on the other instruments. The music is knit together. 
each note complementing the other, each instrument adding value to the other instruments. And that is an awesome illustration of God's church. We rely on each other. Come, I think of what Billy had to say a little while ago about her appreciation for the church. I mean, her appreciation wasn't devoted to this building, was it? Uh, it wasn't that when that she and AJ first came and they walked in and said, this is a nice building, we think we'll come back. That building didn't have anything to do with it, did it, Billy? What had, what had something to do with it were, were the people who made up this congregation. Um, we, we rely on each other. And the more people are willing to share their talents, share their abilities, their giftedness with God's kingdom, the more effective we can be in reaching the lost for Christ. Most of us are somewhat familiar with the children's uh, tale, Winnie the Pooh. He's the little bear that enjoys eating honey. At the end of one particular story, Pooh and another character named Piglet are slowly walking home in silence. And finally, Piglet speaks and he says, When you wake up in the morning, uh, Pooh, what's the first thing you say to yourself? Pooh responds, I say, what's for breakfast? What do you say, Piglet? Piglet answers, I say, I wonder what's going to happen exciting today. Wow, what a difference. Tremendous difference between those two outlooks. Pooh is only thinking of his next meal, really only thinking of himself. While on the other hand, Piglet is anticipating great things every day. As the praise team comes to lead us in our closing song today, I just want to encourage every Christian to wonder what great things are going to happen today in God's kingdom. Would you join me in wondering what great things are going to happen uh, at Avalon in, in the next year, in the next several years, uh, until Christ comes? What, what great things are going to take place uh, here? Don't just be worried about what's for breakfast or what's for lunch today, uh, what's going to happen for me, but as you wonder, uh, how might God want to use me my talent, my ability in accomplishing something significant for his church. I personally am excited about what God has in store for Avalon. We have a proud heritage and exciting future. And so today, let's recommit ourselves to, to be an integral part of that future by using our talents for Jesus Christ. Now, some of you may be sitting there saying, you know, Jimmy said some good things today, but I don't know what my talent is. Uh, I don't have a clue what my giftedness is. Well, that's a good starting place to pray and search. Maybe ask somebody else, uh, what is it that you think I could do? Or maybe experiment by teaching a Sunday school class or helping in the nursery and asking God to show you where your strong points are and where your weak points are. But together, let's be challenged for the days ahead to use our talents, use our giftedness for him. Today, as we sing our closing song, if you're not a Christian, then the invitation is to you to make that good confession that we referred to earlier, that you believe that Christ is the Son of the living God, to be willing to be buried with him in the waters of Christian baptism today, uh, making that decision for eternity uh, and for eternal life. And if you're already an immersed believer desiring to place your fellowship here, uh, we would invite you to come and make that decision as well. As we stand.